So good morning. We uh, did a song this morning that you may not have known. Um, Touch the Sky. How many of you did not know Touch the Sky? Or did you all know it? How many of you did know it? This is how I know who's, who's not answering it at all. <laughs> Only three of you knew it and three of you didn't know it. So <laughs> the rest of you, I don't know where you're... Now, you may not have known it, and, and so I want to go back to it and look at the lyrics of it, because if you're anything like me, um, the first, first, especially the first couple, three times, you, you, you're kind of like you're, you're listening and you're watching and you're not... You, you know, you don't really absorb the words. So I just want to... We're in this series right now. We're doing five weeks of just looking at some contemporary songs and, and just saying, what's, what's the essence? What, what, what are they getting at here? And of course, obviously, looking at the scripture, that, that, that backs it up. And, and this one's a pretty cool tune uh, as well. Touch the, the sky. Here, here's here's uh, some of the lyrics of it. What fortunes lie beyond the stars, those dazzling heights too vast to climb. I got so high to fall so far, but I found heaven as love swept low. My heart beating, my soul breathing. I found my life when I laid it down. Key word, key phrase, key phrase there. That's Jesus talk right there. I found my life when I laid it down. Upward falling, spirit soaring. I touched the sky when my knees to the ground. Let's talk about prayer, right? Uh, in, in communication with, with the God of the universe. I, when, when my knees hit the ground, I touched touch the sky. What treasure waits your, within your scars? The gift of freedom gold can't buy. I bought the world and sold my heart. You traded heaven to have me again. How many times have we chased after the world, right? And s- traded our soul, and bought the world with our heart, right? You traded heaven to have me again. My heart beating, my soul breathing. I found my life when I laid it down. Forward falling, spirit soaring. I touched the sky when my knees hit the ground. Find me here at your feet again. Everything I am, reaching out, I surrender. Can you say that today? I, I, ho- I, hope, I, hope you're, I hope you sung that, like the truth, right? Find me here at your feet again, at the foot of the cross, at your feet again, everything I am, reaching out, I surrender. Come sweep me up in your love again, and my soul will dance on the wings of forever. I read an interview uh, this week and watched a little video, too, uh, of the songwriters uh, for this uh, tune, talking about, well, where did it come from? And they were talking about when they were developing this particular album uh, th- that uh, they wanted the foundation to, of the album to just kind of go back to our faith, the foundation of our faith, right? It didn't want it to be a fluffy little s- song of poems necessarily, but they go back to the foundation of our faith, they, they, you know, back to like Sermon of the Mount type stuff when Jesus was saying, this is what the kingdom is, this is what it's all about, this is what living for Jesus means. And, and uh, you know, just the whole, the whole all these concepts, to, to forgive when you'd rather hold a grudge. I mean, doesn't it feel better to, to hate someone? You know, doesn't it feel better to hold something against? And Jesus says, no, 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 let that go and, and forgive. To serve others when you'd rather be served. Who doesn't want to be served? Uh, you know, it, 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 and Jesus is like, no, no, you serve, you serve. You be the one who serves. To pray when it seems like it would be so much easier to do it on our own. I got this thing figured out. I got life figured out. I know what I'm doing. I don't need Jesus, you know, unless I'm in trouble. But to pray, to pray first to love when it's so much easier to hate and so the goal of this song was to blow up the misconceptions we have about what we think what we tend to think success is both spiritually and and materially and and physically and so forth our our desire to hang out with all the right people however we we define that at the moment right to have the right look to have to have the right things and and to own all the right stuff to experience all the right experiences so that we can go to bed each night and feel content that that, hey we've we've been successful we we're doing well we're we're, we're doing really great we've accomplished so much in our lives to be uh, impressed with the the treasures that we have amassed for ourselves. We feel good about that. And when we want to attend, of course, the right church and say the right prayers and, and, and know the right verses and wear the right t-shirts with the right verses on it, that whole type of thing, right? So that somehow we'll find favor with God and he'll bless us even more. And that's kind of Christianity as, as we know it a lot in America today. But, but Jesus said all kinds of crazy things. You, you think, things like, you know, you'll find your life when you lose it. That's, that's going back to Sermon on the Mount type stuff. You'll find your life when you give it up, when you lay it down. That's when you'll really find life. You don't really begin to live until you learn how to die. 
to yourself. And so what this song does is it merges these two worlds of the reality we live in and the goal that we have to live as kingdom people, as people of Jesus. And, and it reminds us that we touch the sky when we drop to our knees in prayer. That's, that's when we really have access. That's when we really are, are, are moving things on heaven, on earth. It's when our knees are down, not necessarily when we're rolling up our sleeves and getting her done. It's when we're on our knees before the Father in prayer that we find our lives when we lay them down. The, the, the song, if, if you look at it, as, as I read through it, I was trying to get the, really the gist of what this is saying. Uh, I, I saw a lot of uh, prayer and surrender, right? That, that, that's what I'm catching in, in, in the lyrics here is prayer and surrender. Drop into your knees in prayer and you're accessing the Father and you're surrendering all before him. And if you think about it, uh, prayer in itself is surrender, right? I mean, the fact that we pray is surrendering the fact that uh, I can't do this. Right? I'm, not, I'm not qualified. I'm not smart enough to make all the right decisions. Uh, I can't get myself out of every hole I get myself buried in. I can't, I can't do all the things I think I can do. Uh, prayer is a surrender. I can't do this life without you, God. I can't find the joy in life that I'm looking for without you, God. I can't find the fulfillment or the peace that I'm looking for without you, God. That, that, that's, that's, it boils down to prayer. It boils down to, to, to surrender. So Jesus uh, told his disciples a parable once, a parable, a little story. You know, it's not necessarily true. It's, it's usually a made-up little story. But, and, and the story is about a, a widow who went to a judge. And, and we don't know what the situation was. There, there was some injustice somewhere. And she went to a judge and said, man, can you help me out here? And the judge didn't care. He didn't care about God. He didn't fear God. didn't fear man. didn't care about the widow. And he's like, no. He's just being mean. And so she came back again. Will you help me out in this situation? He says, no. Will you help me out? No. She kept going back. He kept saying no. And, and basically, she finally wore him down. She just kept coming back and coming back over and over and over again. He kept saying no, and he kept saying no. And finally, he was like, how do I get this woman to be quiet? I'll just say yes. So he finally says yes, and she gets her justice. <laughs> and, and it's interesting that Luke introduces this little story that Jesus tells with, with, with this these words in, in Luke 18, verse 1. He told them a parable to, to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. The goal Jesus had for his disciples is don't stop praying. Don't quit praying. Don't give up. Huge, 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 huge lesson. But, but how often do we stop praying? You know? How often do we give up on prayer? Oh, I don't have time. It's boring. It's just, I don't, uh, it, you know, stuff's happening. You know, what, whatever. We, we forget all these things. And, and so Jesus says, you, just, you know what? If God, who is loving and, and cares and, and is just, you know, if, if this judge who isn't loving and just will, will listen, how much more will the Father, who is loving and just, how much more will he listen? Just, just pray. Just pray. It's the whole point of his parable here. And if you read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, first four uh, books of, of the New Testament, you will see Jesus praying all the time. I mean, not like solid, but he's just, it's like he's just continually referencing Jesus praying at big and little points in his life. Matthew records him praying eight times, or nine times, excuse me. Mark tells us eight prayers of Jesus. Luke records 13 different prayers of Jesus. John gives us five and it wasn't just when he was in need. Sometimes he was in need. It wasn't just when he was distressed, although sometimes he was distressed. Uh, it, it, he just he prayed when good things happened, when bad things happened. He prayed at all times. He, he prayed a lot. He just didn't stop praying. And so I just have a, a list of a few things. We're just going to walk through some of these. Uh, this isn't all of them, but it, it gives you a pretty good idea uh, of the kinds of things that Jesus prayed for. He prayed at his baptism. This was a big day. This was the beginning of his ministry. This was kind of the coming out of, hey, by the way, I'm here to do a purpose type of thing. And it says in Luke chapter 3, verse 21, when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened. Isn't that cool? He's baptized, he's praying, and the heavens open up. Isn't it odd to think that, that, that when you pray, the heavens open like our open up. You're praying to the same Father, right? You're praying to the same God, to the same throne room, to the same everything. It's, I mean, you don't happen to be the literal Son of God like he was, but, but you're praying to the same God. Now, probably, you know, a dove doesn't ascend and, and he doesn't say, here is my Son who I'm well pleased when you pray. 
However, you are his sons and daughters in a, in a different type of way, a spiritual type of way, and you're praying to that same father. Why would we not pray more? Why would we not spend more time on our knees and less time doing some of the trivial things that we do? Well, Jesus prayed at his uh, baptism. That was a pretty big, pretty big day. Uh, he also prayed before selecting the 12, the 12 disciples. Uh, big decision, huge decision. This was a foundational thing, again, in his ministry. Luke chapter 6, verse 12. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them 12 whom he named apostles. So hundreds are following him at this point. There's big crowds. A lot of people want to be a part of him. Any, lots of people want to be chosen. And he's, he doesn't just choose his favorites. He doesn't just choose the ones who he thinks will, will be the easiest to manage or will all get along the best. Matter of fact, some of these come from politically extremely opposite views if you look into their, their life. And what he does, he spends the night praying. He's the son of God, and he wants the Father to direct him. He goes to prayer. It's a big day. It's a big moment. Now, now, I don't know how you make your decisions in life. Do you do, you, you know, do the pros and cons and the, the, that type of thing? Do you use logic? Do you use advice from people? Probably a combination of things. Here's the deal. Never forget to pray. When you're making any big decision in life, little decisions too. Pray, 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 pray. I'll never forget going to Taiwan. This was in 1994. So this was a long time ago. That's how much of an impression it made on me that I still remember the missionaries there. They would pray about literally everything. I mean, we, we would get in the van to go downtown to do whatever we were going to do, and they would pray in the van before they left because they wanted God to God, guide that trip and to guide their decisions and just guide what was going on. Pray, pray, pray. Always pray, don't forget. Why do we keep forgetting? <laughs> Here's another one. The, uh, Jesus prayed after his rejection in uh, Galilee. In Galilee, he did all kinds of just amazing miracles. I mean, I mean, crazy stuff. Matthew, uh, the gospel writer, says that most of his mighty works were done in Galilee, this, this area of communities, t towns here, right? And in this area, the people rejected him. I mean, he did incredible things, incredible miracles and stuff, stuff just, just you know, blind that can see, leprosy, a race, all kinds of crazy things. And, and the people right in front of him would see him do this incredible miracle, and they're like, yeah, whatever. You're like a carpenter, right? I mean, they, they still didn't get it. And, and so in response, after a while, he decided it's time to move on. I'm going someone else. And he, and he gives uh, a warning, so to speak. It gives a series of woes to the, to the areas, uh, to those towns. You know, woe to you, Bethsaida, and all these different areas. And, and he basically says, you know what? If I had done in Sodom and Gomorrah the very same things I did in front of you, they would have repented. You didn't. If I'd gone to Sidon and Tyre, two, two other cities that were known for evil in the past, and done the miracles I've done in front of you, they would have repented. You've chosen not to. Right? And, and so he was a little bit ticked off at, at the people and the area there. And, and then he prays. Now, the very next thing in verse 25 of Matthew 11 says, At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. So he's praying that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. So he faced rejection. I mean, he, came, he only came to save people, right? I mean, he wasn't coming. I mean, he came for their good, but they're like, ah, we're smarter than you. We don't need some, you know, well, these days they say old-fashioned Jesus, but even then they, had, you know, they came up with a different excuse. We don't need you, Jesus. We don't want to live your life. We don't want to do your thing. So they rejected him, and he prayed. And God, it was, it was, it was, it was what, a, what a change, what a, what a prayer. It was kind of a change of perspective, change of perspective type prayer. Uh, okay, God, that's all happened, and it was bad, and, and, but I've got to move on. Thank you. At least, at least the children get it. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, you're going to face rejection, right? You're going to have bad days at work. You're going to have things go wrong. You're going to have people who treat you poorly and all that thing. Uh, that's a good time to pray. Maybe that'll help change your perspective some. Hey, at least something else is going well. <laughs> you know, uh, you know uh, at least God's doing some blessings somewhere else in your life. And, and it's, it's a change of perspective. Even Jesus did that in, in his uh, uh, spiritual walk in times of rejection uh, in Galilee. Another prayer time for him was uh, times of spiritual invitation. 
Jesus had his 12. He had been teaching them for two years. He'd been telling them all over again, I'm not a political guy, I'm, I'm a spiritual guy, right? I'm not making a, a political revolution. We're doing a spiritual revolution. They're all looking for a political. We want to th- overthrow Rome. He's saying, that's not what I'm here for. I'm here to, to flip the spiritual world upside down. I'm here to change everything, right? They're kind of starting to get it, but they don't really get it yet. So, one day in Luke 19, he's alone praying, but his disciples are kind of with him. And he interrupts himself to, to ask them a question. Verse 18, now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he asked him. So he's praying, whatever he's praying. He's like, hey guys, I've got a question for you. So he asked them, who did the crowd say that I am? And they answered, well, John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Others say one of the prophets of old who has risen. So all these people who had died, maybe they've come back. Something, something's unusual. It's not just a, a guy. All the people are going, there's something different about Jesus, right? Then he said to them, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, well, the Christ. The Christ of God. The Christ, the Son of the living God, is how Matthew says it. The Christ, the Messiah. Christ is Christos, Greek for Messiah. You are the Messiah. You're the one we're waiting for. You're the, you're the one who's going to change everything. This is a big moment. This is a big moment for his disciples. It was the first time his disciples verbally said they got it. Now we know they still struggled in and out with getting it, who he really was. But this was a big moment for them. This was them moving forward in the faith. And it became a foundational part of our faith. I mean, that, that is, we're built around that idea that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He's not a God. He, he's not just one of the many ways to heaven. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. When we take a confession of faith for someone, we ask someone, do you believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? And they say yes. Do we baptize them in that little baptismal pool right there? And they go under and they were baptized with Christ. And that is a big moment in their life. That is a big moment in the history of the church. It goes a lot back to this statement right here. All happened in the context of, of obviously teaching that's happened for a couple of years, but in the context of, of prayer. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, hey, who do people say that I am? Prayer was involved with this. Here's the, the point. You have lots of conversations with people. People at work, there might be little conversations. There might be a simple question. Hey, who do you think Jesus is? That's a big question. But it could be other little questions that, that pop in and, and, and out. You, you might not be on there, you know, knocking on a stranger's door. Can I tell you about Jesus? It might be just people you know that you're having a conversation with, someone in the family, whoever, it doesn't matter. Always pray, always pray before having that conversation, before opening your mouth. Man, I spend so much time just having quiet prayers in my head before I open my mouth. Uh, some people think I'm just being quiet. Actually, I'm having quite the conversation. It's just not with you. <laughs> you know, it, it, I'm, okay, God, give me, I, I'm, I'm a fool, I'm an idiot. I, I'm going to bumble my words. I'm not going to say things. Uh, I need your help. Uh, what am I going to say to this person? And, and just pray, 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 because this is a big moment in that person's life. You know, sometimes we'll rely on our own persuasive skill or, you know, I've got, I've got, I've got mad sales skills, whatever it is. You know, I, I don't want to persuade anybody to do anything. That's not my job. I'll present you the information and, and you can either respond or not. It's up to you. It's between you and God. But I'm going to be praying that God convicts your heart. You know, I'm not going to make sure everything's being played in E minor so you're like all feeling sad and I'm going to do a little poem and try to rope you in with a you know, sad story. Um, I mean, there, there are techniques, right? No, we're going to let God, he's, he's big, he can handle that. So we're, we pray every week before, uh, you know, that, that, that God works in your hearts and, and um, you do that when you talk to people. Do that all the time. Have that conversation with God regularly. Pray and don't give up. Pray and don't give up. How about times of deep sorrow? Jesus prayed then, too. Uh, we're very familiar with the story of Lazarus. seems like last year we, we hit it two or three times, so I'm not going to get into detail. But Lazarus died, and his sisters are overwhelmed with grief, and Jesus goes to the grave, and he's deeply moved. This is one of those moments when he you know, says he wept, and everybody's crying, and it's a terrible moment. Um, it's, it's a lot of sadness and grief. And, and they take away the stone because he's like, okay, we're going to fix this thing. Roll the stone back. And they're like, oh, this is going to be gross. What are you talking about? He's dead. He's been dead. It's going to smell. And he's rolled away the stone. So they rolled away the stone. Luke, or excuse me, John eleven forty one says they took away the stone. Jesus lifted up his eyes. So he's praying, right? He said, Father, I thank you. You've heard me. So here he knows what's going to happen. Here he knows 
Lazarus is going to come walking out of there. But he's saying this for everybody else to hear. Father, I thank you. You've heard me. I knew you've always heard me and hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around. They may believe that you sent me. And then he raises Lazarus from the dead. Now, we're going to face, so that's life, right? We're going to face times of sorrow. We're going to face times of sadness and gloom and just deep, deep hurt. It's just going to happen in life. Sometimes we're tempted to run to everything but God. Those are the times to run to God. Run to God. Run to God. Pray and don't give up. Pray and don't give up. Keep running to God. Run to God. Even when you're angry, he, he knows. He knows. You, you, you can't hide that from him. You're not like, well, I'm not going to talk to him. I'm mad at him. He, he, already, yeah, he already knows. Just, just, just talk. Run to him first. How about the Last Supper? A time when, when Jesus prayed. In Matthew 26, uh, they're eating. It says in 26, now as they were eating, Jesus took the bread after blessing it, praying. He recited a, a typical blessing at the Passover meal. It was part of a prayer. He broke it, gave it to the disciples, said, take, eat, this is my body. He took a cup. When he gave it thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Now, this is, this is hours before his death. He knows what's coming next. He, he knows next he's going to the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane. He knows he's going to be arrested. He knows the trials are going to happen. He knows the cross is going to happen. All right. But he's still in the head. He blesses it. He breaks the bread. Hey, just think of this broken bread as my body being torn apart for you. That's, that's about, they don't know what he's saying. I'm about to tear my body apart for you. You drink this, go ahead, drink this wine. I want you to think of this, this from now on. When you drink this wine, you think of my blood on that cross as it dripped down. You're going to see me die in a few hours. You think about that. I'm doing it for you. I'm doing it so you can have forgiveness. I'm doing it so you can have a new life. I'm doing it so you can start over. I'm doing this for you. And so he prayed actually several times during the Passover meal. He prayed for himself. John 17 gives a pretty lengthy description of his prayer, praying for himself. He's praying for the disciples who were there, knowing that they're going to be scattered. You know, it's pretty soon they're going to be alone without him. He prays for the future church, us. He prays for unity. He prays for all kinds of things. In John chapter 17, you can just read a whole lot of his actual prayer. And then we get to Gethsemane, and that's the garden. And it's his last moment of freedom, so to speak. And he's there, and it says in Luke 22, he withdrew from them, about his the disciples, about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and he prayed. And Luke tells us that his anguish was so strong that his sweat was like drips of blood, right? I mean, he, he was in total anguish. It's like blood dropping to the ground as he was sweating. And this is where Jesus prays three times, not will, my will, but yours be done. Uh, God, I'm really thinking about this. There's so many different directions I can go. Uh, I know this was the plan. Maybe we can do plan B. You know, all these things could be going through his mind. I don't know what he's, no one knows what he's thinking. But he's struggling. We know that. And he boils it down every time to not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. Then you get to the cross. And there's a number of prayers on the cross. But the final prayer of Jesus is in Luke chapter 23, verse 46, when it says, Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now, as you look at the life of Jesus, and the life that Jesus calls us to live as followers, it is filled with prayer and sacrifice. That's what we see. I mean, this isn't like an isolated story. Hey, Jesus prayed that one time. Yeah, we should probably pray too. No, this is something we should always pray and not give up. It is filled with prayer and sacrifice, prayer and sacrifice, prayer and sacrifice. You know, it, it was popular a number of years ago for people to make uh, Christianity kind of sound like an easy day on the beach, you know, just wave your hand, woohoo, say, how do you do, you're in, you know, that's really great. And, and, and a lot of people uh, were really deceived by that because they completely wiped out like Matthew. <laughs> just don't read the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> you know, just don't read what Jesus really said, you know. It, it's an easy ride, just come on in and smile and nod. No, that's what, that's what Christianity is. It, 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 it's not. Jesus calls for sacrifice. Uh, Jesus calls for us to lose our lives and follow him. Jesus calls for us to, to give up our will. It's something he did himself. 
You know, it's, it's not like he just sitting high and mighty saying, I'm not going to do it, but you, I want you to do it. He gave up his will and went to the cross, right? You know, talk about sacrifice. Talk about dying. He went all the way, quite, quite literally. So he calls for us to lose our lives. He calls for us to give up our will and to follow him. He calls us to deny ourselves and to do as he says. And the reality is, Christianity is hard. Sometimes it's just challenging. It's not for the weak of heart. It's not for the easy ride. It's not, it's not, you know, coasting down the hill of life, going with your arms in the air, going, yee you know, it's sometimes it's just plain difficult. You will have family members that look at you and say, you are crazy. You're taking this far too seriously. Have you ever had that? Well, why, do you, why are you always doing this church thing? Why are you always quoting Jesus? You know, what, what are you doing? Come, in, come on. You know, you're going to have family members who think you're just insane. They, some will even hate you for it. You will have friends turn their back on you. Who hasn't had that? You may lose a job because of, of your faith. Our culture will not always like you because you're following Jesus one way and they're all running rapidly the other opposite direction and we're not going the same direction. It's not that we're trying to tell them how to live. It's just we're just going different directions. We look at life differently. And so sometimes culture is going to look at you, culture at large, and just say, you're a bunch of idiots. What's wrong with you? That's not fun. That's not easy street. Sometimes it's sacrifice. Sometimes it's, it's difficult. But Jesus says, come and I'll give you peace. My burden's light. Really it is. I'm not going to give you a big old honking list of do's and don'ts and try to you know, nail you to a cross. I'm being nailed to the cross. All right? You just follow me. You just follow me, and I will give you peace. You lay down your life, I'll give you mine. You lose yourself, I will give you eternity. And this song that we sung this morning is sung by people like you and I who are just kind of struggling through life, trying to figure out their faith. And they've lived their life long enough that they have searched and searched in the wrong places at least a few times for a while to enough to go that didn't work and and i gotta do something differently and this is a song of people who've made a change and a turn in their lives and they finally found their lives when they surrendered to jesus now I don't know where everybody's at in your spiritual walk. We're all in different places. You know, and that's not my, I'm not going to try to figure you out. I mean, that's not my job. I can't figure, I'm not smart enough, I'm not qualified. But you know, you know, right? God has called for everything, right? When we talk about sacrifice, he's called for everything. He wants all of you. What are you holding on to? What is it that you haven't given him yet? What area of your life... It's none of my business. You don't have to tell me. You probably don't even have to think very hard. You probably had something immediately come to your mind. Well, I'm not giving up that thing. Or I haven't yet. He calls you for 100% dedication to him. What is it you haven't given up? I want to challenge you to lay it down. Not, not, not to me. I'm nobody. Lay it down at the cross of Jesus, at the feet of Jesus again. Let it go. Surrender it to Jesus. It's time to take another step forward in your faith. Whatever that means to you. Wherever it is in your faith. Whatever step you need to take. Some of you may, it's time for you to get baptized. You just haven't done it. You just, you've just been thinking, eh, you've been putting your time, whatever. You haven't done it. Hey, guess what? Put water on it yesterday. It's fresh. It's warm. It's ready to go. What are you waiting for? Some of you just need to give up some area of your life you've been holding on to. I don't know what it is. You know. You need to surrender it. You need to give it to Jesus. You need to let him take lordship of that area in your life. I want, I want to invite you. The prayer room is back there in the corner. You can go back there and hang out in the prayer room and just do whatever. Have a heart to heart to God. Give him all you want. You can come up here and, and just sing. <laughs> We're going to sing this song again. And, and I hope this last verse of this song resonates with you. Find me here at your feet again. Talking to Jesus. Everything I am reaching out, I surrender. Come sweep me up in your love again and my soul will dance on the wings forever. I want that. I want that for you. I can't surrender for you. That's your job. Jesus can't surrender for you. That's your job. So I encourage you as we sing to make that your prayer to him. Surrender. Let's stand. <laughs>